Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Eat Meat and Question Everything. Today, I have my friend Jess on. Hi, Jess. Hi, Cole. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to chat with you. Me too. Love to hang out with you. Yeah. So, okay, what's going on? Say hi to everyone. Let them know who you are, where you are, what's going on. Okay, so I'm Jessica, and Courtney and I met a couple of years back when I came across the carnivore community. And I'm, I am a health and fitness specialist, so I've been in the industry for about 22 years. And um, yeah, we just, we love everything health and health related and exploring that kind of thing. So um, I'm in New Zealand. It is early hours, of, well, not super early, but I've already been up, watched the sunrise, had a beach walk, done a workout, and now I'm here with you. So I'm so happy to be here. And that's so awesome that you did all that because that's kind of what we're talking about today, like doing some other things than just carnivore, you know, like how we keep ourselves well and healthy and all those little things, because it's so much more than just eating meat. So you've had a morning filled with that. I went to the gym today, but I, I didn't even work out. Um, it was like, we did kind of like a self-care day. So I just, um, I went with Jeff. We had, uh, the morning off, um, from the kids. And we went and we did the hot tub and we laid by the pool and we hung out in the cafe. So I went to the gym today, but I did not work <laughs> out. I don't know if that counts. <laughs> oh, it totally counts. Yeah. yeah. So what did you what did you do for your workout? So I did a new workout this morning. So I'm actually training for Ultimate Athlete at the moment. So it's just a little um obstacle race so I've done a couple of them in London when I was living over there and they're just super fun to do so it's like 30 to 50 obstacles over x amount of distance now being in New Zealand this one's at the beach which is so much nicer than the ones that I did in England which were just like mud farms and through electric and under ice and all the things (laughs) this is going to be completely different from something I've done before but I'm really excited and I'm just doing it for fun um so Typically for the moment, I'm meant to be training for that. But this morning I did like a circuity based one at a new gym that I was just trying out. Sometimes I like to just try out, see what the community offers and that kind of jazz. Um, So yeah, it was just a a variety of resistance exercises for about 50 minutes or so, quite high intensity. It was really fun though. I like exercise where I'm not thinking about the fact that I'm exercising. Mm -hmm. That's That's the ideal. So yeah, it was really good. That's awesome. That's funny that you say that, that you're training for an obstacle course, because me and Jeff were just talking like a week or so ago, like, should we be like, should we do a Spartan? Um, I've done like a mud run and, or or a tough mudder. And I'm trying to remember like what it was. I feel like it was like eight miles with a bunch of obstacles and it was hard. This was before kids. And do they have Spartans where you are? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So he's done like the trifecta. So which is like the the sprint, the beast, and the there's another. Oh gosh, I didn't know we were going to talk about this. Otherwise, I would have wrote it down. But there's like three <laughs> levels: um, sprint, beast, and something else. Darn it. And um, I haven't done any of them. And we were talking about maybe like signing up for one. But oh man, it's a lot of work. I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> and they're long too like the sprint obviously is not long it's I want to say maybe even like three or four or five miles but the other ones are like gnarly I don't even know how long like 12 plus miles for the bigger one one. in London was Tough Mudder and that was 12 miles okay that was a that that was a big one how Um, long is the one you're training for I'm just doing the little it's a 6k so we're going crazy Zealand. so they have a three six or ten k and I hate running like with a vengeance it's not my forte of exercise at all and like mechanically I'm definitely more of a fast twitch fiber type of girl rather than endurance I just don't enjoy it um and although I did it for that event ages ago because I had to and I got to the point that I could run that distance quite comfortably I just it's just a waste of time and energy so I'm not a runner but so I'm just doing the six And we're doing it just for fun. It's not like, oh, yeah, I'm going to, you know, compete an ultimate athlete. I just want to do it just to keep life interesting because it's it's about play, right? Exercise is meant to be uplifting. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be, you know, getting all your heart rate and all the things going. But also, like, mentally, it should be something that you really enjoy and you look forward to. 
So I just kind of throw these things in there every now and again, just to keep it spicy. No. Um, and that's a good idea. Good. Yeah. I don't, I don't like running either. I think where running is good is like, I feel like everyone should be able to like do a mile or two and do it quickly in case you need to like save yourself or run away from zombies or, you know, for something like that. Um, but yeah, the, the running gene skipped me. My parents were, did a lot of running. My dad still runs. He's how old is he? Like 70, is he 70? He was born in 53. So whatever that math is. Um, and he runs like every Sunday morning, he does like an eight mile run and he's still faster than I am. And he's done like 20 plus marathons, like Boston marathon a handful of times. So like very fit, lots of triathlons. My mom did, um, the iron man with my stepdad and here's me. I went to the gym today and didn't even work out. You know, like I, I am slacking in the exercise department. <laughs> Maybe it'll hit your children instead. You never know. <laughs> oh, and it has. Like mine are, they do not stop. I'm like, can we get a five-year-old in track? Like, do they start track this young? Because this kid just yeah. freaking runs. <laughs> <laughs> I've got mine in athletics and she's three and a half and they call it mini club. And so it's this, you know, they do the little running things, but they'll be like carrying a cup of water from one end to the other end. So it's so cute, but she loves it too. And she like pumps her little arms and it's so sweet. But yeah, it's good to get them into it if, if they love it. Um, yeah. I did Brazilian jiu-jitsu for a while and I loved that because same deal. Like you're not thinking about exercising. You're literally squashed underneath somebody trying to like find your way out and, and try <laughs> strangle them and oh my god it was just right up my alley um but I'm not sure if I it's not hugely public but last year I had my very old 20 year old breast implants removed yeah. yes I remember you it's, talking about that or at least to me I, you didn't really share much maybe okay. in your stories huh I think it was like a little bit around but I didn't talk a huge amount about it um but what that meant was that I couldn't do jujitsu because obviously this is like you know you're pressed up against people and I had to have this whole healing um thing going on so I'd like to get back into that this year as well just to do something different that would I be awesome pole, too. Pole, pole is amazing as well for strength training okay oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. I thought you said polo. I'm like, okay, interesting. Yeah. You know, pole. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would so, be so think, hard. Oh, it is. It is. And it's so fun. Like when you complete a move, it's just, yeah, it's just, I love exercise that brings me joy and play. So it's. Yeah. Fun. That's a good idea too. And that's a good way to like, think about it. Like, what can you do that's fun? Like you don't always have to go. I mean, lifting weights, I think is great. We need to, as women to be throwing away, throwing away, throwing around heavy shit, but what can you do? That's fun. You know? Yeah. Okay. And that has me thinking as well. Like being a girl, I like doing pole because you have to be ridiculously strong. Like it's calisthenics basically. And but also there's like an element of like, ooh, I'm being like sensual. And it it's, it is it is fun. And obviously because you're doing it with heaps of other girls, there's that, that, that community, there's that connection, which is really important in stimulating different parts of our vagus nerve and actually affecting our health of our nervous system. And so play and fun and connection is a huge part of us actually being healthy. So if you can incorporate play into your exercise, it's like a double win. Yeah, definitely. And you know what? They make that pull look so easy. Like you look at it and you're like, oh, I could totally do that. I probably couldn't like even hang on. Like I can't even jump up to a pull up bar and like hold myself there. It's an instant collapse. So like there's no way my ass is shimmying up a pole. Like how do you even, <laughs> how does a beginner start? Or is it easier because you get to use your legs? Like how does yeah. one even start? You have to be yeah, in shape to start. start with legs. Uh, yeah so you just get used to kind of compressing the pole this way and you get like especially if you've got strong legs too you can you can compensate not have to use so much upper body but it gets it gets the worst thing about pole is the skin drags on the pole and the mm. burny sensation that like you have to toughen up your skin to get used to kind of sliding on a pole and it yeah <laughs> I am writing this down so I don't forget, like, because I know we have some around here. That would be an interesting workout yes, to try. It go. It's so good. So fun. Uh, what else do you do? Like, do you do any like meditation or any of that kind of like get into, I wouldn't even say meditation is woo, but do you go into 
to any of that? Yeah, I do. I am like as much as what I do with NRT. So I specialize in a neuromuscular based therapy and that's like really scientific. And so everyone's like, oh, this is, this is you and your science brain, but I am hugely spiritual. I'm very much connected and in alignment with, you know, what, what I'm here to bring to the world and how I'm here to help the world and what I want to bring through. So spirituality is like a big part of my life. I get up, I usually watch the sunrise, like this morning I made it to the beach and I'll just like sneak out of the house, leave the kids sleeping, go to the beach, watch the sunrise and I'll do a little meditation there. So um, I learned from this amazing woman who is like a quantum healer Um, how to do a really amazing energy clearing. So you're just clearing out all of the stagnant stills, you know, energy that no longer serves you. And then you're bringing in that, that source energy and filling yourself up. And so I go through this protocol of clearing out my energy and then filling my, my, my energetic field back in. And that's like a beautiful way to start the day as well as watching the sunrise. So I'm starting off all of my circadian rhythm hormones and getting everything on my cortisol levels. And, you know, so I'm affecting, you know, multiple things kind of combined at the same time. And what I've done as well is I've, I've NRT'd my meditation. So I've found a way of supercharging. It's like supercharging the results of what I'm getting from the meditation work I do, um, which is amazing. Um, do you, are you a meditator? Do you, I am when I'm, when I, when I actually like do it, I I'm, I'm hit and miss. Like I'm not good about being consistent, but I do Mm -hmm. love it. And especially like starting the day, doing something for yourself, like what you're doing before you jump into mom mode. It's such Mm -hmm. a huge shift. Like it just makes things a little bit easier because obviously you're coming from like a Zen place and I'm sure there's been a little bit of gratitude in your practice and it really like puts things into perspective. Um, So I've been meaning to do better and get back at it because like the last couple of weeks or even like a month, I've talked about this a little bit that I've been struggling with like emotionally eating and still sticking to carnivore, but like filling a void or easing my stress with food when Mm -hmm. I really just need to get back to like the self-care side of things because that has completely gone out the window. I haven't done any of like, I love like morning journaling, um, Mm -hmm. even just like a brain dump, just getting everything out. Um, so all these like little practices that I know are so important, I haven't been doing them and mm-hmm. I have not been thriving lately, <laughs> you know? So it's like, I want to get back to that. I feel like it's so important. Like it's so much more than just what we eat. It's all the other little things we do. So yes, I love a good meditation. Um, I love like inner child meditations too. I was, I worked with someone in the past. We did like essentially like, I think we did six months of like, of coaching. It was so funny because I, I worked with her before I found carnivore and I worked with her to help like my food issues, essentially. Like we worked together to like get to the root of things and to like shift my thoughts with food. And funny enough, through working with her, I guess I was open enough to like receive carnivore. So anyways, the long long story short, yes, I'm a fan of meditation. Um, I love visualization ones too. Uh, Shout out to my friend, Brooke. She's probably not listening to this, but there's a song. Gosh, I should have wrote it down. I think the song is called Time from the movie. It's from a soundtrack, Inception. I feel like that sounds right. And it's just this instrumental... And it's just, it's just a really powerful song. So if you're listening to this, write it down and check it out and like visualize how you want your life to go. Do you do any of that stuff? Like future yeah, life? I do. I've done, I've done heaps of like past life regression stuff and inner child work and breath work and all the things. Um, and one of my best friends is actually a breath work teacher and she runs some amazing day workshop things. And I, I always go along to those when I can. Um, because I think it's like, it's important to have time for you. Like you said, setting up you, making sure that you're regulated, making sure that you've got capacity to then be able to be there for the little humans in our lives that we're affecting as well as, you know, our husbands or our partners or our, you know, even just in our workplace. When we are coming from a depleted place, 
everything is harder. Like you said, it affects so much of our life and we don't realize and we're like, oh, suddenly I'm not thriving, but it's because you're not putting yourself first. And I think it's like a mum thing. Like we all put ourselves second. That's why I have to like carve out these snippets of my day to make sure that I can have this time to regulate myself. Last, not the December just being, but the one before. So around about 15 months ago, we were lucky enough to be taught how to use NRT with the mind. So NRT is much about neuromuscular control, basically restoring control and function to your body. Um, this is about mind work and trauma work. And it's been so interesting, Court. I've told you like a tiny bit about the changes that have happened in my life since I've been doing this work on myself. And it has been the most transformational thing that I've done in terms of my nervous system health. When I um when I first came across this, I didn't really understand how it worked, right? Because how I understood everything I'd done before, like hypnotherapy, breath work, um, psychotherapy, traumatic coaching, like all these different therapies, I had had improvements in some of the things that I'd gone through in my life. And I thought, okay, these things are helping me you know, get better and, and feel like I can cope with these stresses that are happening. Um, and then when I learned NRT Mind, I was like, wow, there's so much more to this. And actually, you can actually restore and strengthen and essentially complete traumas that are trapped in our nervous system so that they're completely not there anymore, which means that they do not affect you and they don't touch you at a non-conscious level. And so that's been amazing. I'm going to actually teach you a couple of things on the side, me and you, that's going to help with your, how you're feeling, like you regulating yourself. And it takes five minutes a day. It's super, super quick and easy. You do it at the end of your day, just before you get into bed or when you're in bed. And what it does is it actually puts you into a parasympathetic state. So it gets you into that nice, deep relaxation rest state. So that when you go to sleep, your body can do all the healing, all the repair, all the regeneration that it needs to do while you're asleep. Because if we go to sleep and we're dysregulated, then we don't heal. And so that's when sometimes you wake up the next day and you're like, oh my God, I've slept eight hours and I feel like, you know, I'm dragging my ass through this day. It's because we we were potentially in a dysregulated sleep when we went to sleep. And therefore, those processes that our body does to heal are hindered. So I'm going to show you a few little things on the side. I also am creating some amazing nervous system health programs that are coming this year, which I'm super excited because I think most people don't even know what your nervous system is or how it's affected, right? We know there's more to it than just what we put in our mouths. And we know that if our nervous system is in an unhealthy state, then even if we're putting in all the right foods, yeah, our body's not able to digest, break down and absorb those foods because again, we're not in a regulated nervous system state. So this program is going to be amazing because it will actually teach you how to test yourself in real time. So I'll teach you court how to test your nervous system and see what state you're in, if you're in fight or flight or if you're in freeze or if you're in that nice middle homeostasis level. And then once you identify where you're at, how to shift your state again in real time so that you learn to regulate yourself. And this isn't just like, oh, I feel something. This is actually at a physical, you can test your muscles, you can test range of motion to see what, what state you're in and then do something with that to shift your state. Because again, not only when we're dysregulated, do we not heal, but when we're dysregulated, we don't want to load, right? So if I'm in a defensive state or fight or flight or freeze, and I go and put a barbell on my back and start squatting, I am 100% going to hurt myself. All my hormones are going to be dysregulated. I'll probably store body fat. My cortisol levels will go up. Like everything is impacted by the state of our nervous system. But we may not even know. So we walk into the gym thinking, yeah, I'm good to go. And then we end up with tightness, weakness, and pain. And then we're like, why? I didn't load heavier. I felt, you know, what's the problem? So yeah, it's a really, it's going to be a really basic introductionary to what is my nervous system? I'm going to run a three-day free masterclass for people, okay? So this is coming soon. What is my nervous system? How does it work? What does it impact in? And then I'm going to offer a little program so that you can learn to test your own nervous system and then do something with that so that when you're going to do exercise or when you're going to go 
fuel yourself or whatever you're going to do, that all of these systems are going to be at full operating power so that you get the best out of what you're doing. Okay. That sounds amazing. Um, I can tell you right now, I've probably lived the last six months in fight or flight mode, like a hundred percent. So learning how to get myself out of that would be priceless for sure. And I feel like a lot of people can relate mm-hmm. to that. I feel like we're all stressed in one way or another. It's so true. Like so many people are in defensive states and they don't even know it. And then when you do know it and you go, okay, I can identify my state. What do I do with that now? Like, because it isn't always about taking a deep breath. Like breath work's amazing. No criticism to anything of that. But depending on your state, if you are in a a free state and then you go and do some deep relaxation work, it's going to take you further into that dorsal branch of your nervous system, which is further into that free state where actually what you want to do is something ventral vagal to stimulate yourself, to pull yourself out of that defensive state. And so it's not always about breathing and meditating. Maybe what you need to do right then and there is actually connect with someone, smile with your eyes, you know, um, do something ventral vagal. So that's stimulatory. So getting your sympathetic nervous system working to pull you out of that low branch. So it's about knowing when to apply what, whereas if we're in a stimulated state, we want to calm the system. So that's when you want to be doing those breath breath work. So it's knowing where you're at and then knowing what to do with it so that you can regulate and everything works well. Because otherwise it's just, it's all a guess, right? And most of us have no bloody clue where we're at half the time. <laughs> We're frantic or we're frazzled or we're whatever, but we don't know. So yeah, it's going to be epic. I'm really excited to do that. And the only way that I've been able to facilitate that is, I don't know if I told you this, but I've dropped 90%, 95% of my client base. You did say that. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. It's scary. It's scary. Like getting it, it comfortable in my nervous system as well, that it's okay to do that because I have, since I was 12 years old, I have worked and worked and worked and scrolled and grind and, you know, because I grew up in a very poor environment you know my mum was a single mum and every day because in New Zealand you pay your week like weekly rent and every day it got closer to that rent day and I could feel the anxiety of my mum and feel the fear and so I never wanted my kids to be in an environment that they felt scared about where they were going to if they were going to have a meal or if they were going to have a roof over their heads so my defensive state that got wired into my nervous system non-consciously without my control was that you need a you need to work you need to provide for your family and that you don't rely on anybody but yourself so these things are like ingrained in me so getting myself to a state that I can go no I'm going to do this now I'm going to be not with patience all day I'm going to be working on creating these amazing programs that the world need desperately And that means that I have to divert my time and attention to that and not be with patients all day, which is, yeah, it's it's only my second week. Last (laughs) week I had two VIP clients. This week I've got, I'm only doing two clients for the next three to six months. And it's, yeah, it's just getting comfortable with that and going, okay, you're doing something else now, but I'm really excited for it. That is exciting. And yeah, it's scary because you know, that's a huge shift, but it's a shift to help more people. I mean, if you're doing one-on-one client sessions, uh, there's only so much you can scale your business one-on-one. So to reach more people and spread the word, then yeah, having these, you know, courses and and masterclasses and all that is amazing. So I'm excited to see what you have coming up. Um, That sounds really awesome. What else do you do? Do you do any EFT, the tapping? I've only tried it once. I don't know anything about it. I've been tapping for years, actually. Okay. Yeah, because I'm such a nerd from like forever. Okay. Those don't know me. Born as a sick baby, covered in eczema, uh, gut issues, skin issues, heaps of problems, put in an incubator for a little while, problems growing, problems thriving. Like I was born sick. And so I feel like, me getting into health was just a byproduct of me being sick and looking to feel okay, looking to feel okay in my body and to feel healthy. And so I did all the things I've done, everything you can think of in terms of that kind of thing. So yeah, I've done, I did tapping for ages and it was super beneficial. I loved it. Um, Because of where I'm at now, I don't use that technique because I don't need to. 
but it's it's really effective and I've used it with heaps of clients too and it's super simple um I remember driving through you know being on the London buses like you know tapping my face <laughs> and under my arm and just like anywhere and I'm I'm sure I looked like a complete lunatic but yeah I've done all the things but yeah I'm not so much tapping anymore um what I use as well is I use a few little biohacks so I use infrared <clears throat> I use um, these kind of, um, these are your grounding mats, so okay. earthing mats. So I've got earthing sheets and earthing mat. The idea was that I got that and I was going to put it on the floor so that when I'm treating clients on the table, I would be grounding all day. But what I found is, is my clients were in such a bad state that I was like, oh, I'm just going to put it on the table so that they get an hour of They need this more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> um so it ended up going on the table but yeah I use that and then I've got this little gadget here which is a laser watch so this is called an endo watch and it has all of these different lasers and they basically beam directly into your radial artery and affect your mitochondrial function it's basically like having your blood cleaned it's like without all the nasties taken out it affects mold parasites your mitochondrial function like it's pretty amazing um and I don't know if it's I don't even know what countries this is available in because as part of my detox I poisoned myself with these breast implants right 20 years of wearing silicon bags in my body I gave myself almost an autoimmune condition it was pretty bad so when I was in London I had all this treatment I had um lipid transfusions I had these laser beams but directly like intravenously beamed directly into my bloodstream. I had all this stuff done. And after I had those treatments, I was in a position to actually be able to purchase one of these to take home with me because you can't get these in New Zealand. So I don't know if you can get them here, but these are pretty amazing. So I, I use this for half an hour a day. I have grounding mats and earthing sheets and I use infrared as well. Um, so you've got a few little things. What about you? Are you a, are you a grounding mat, earthing sheet kind of gal? Um, I don't have an earthing mat. I've always been kind of like skeptical. I don't know. Um, but I do try and like go outside barefoot and do all that. I'm just mm. really bad about using everything I have. I have um, like the red light panel, a small one, really bad about using it. I have my orange glasses, like the blue light blockers. Um, like you name it, I probably have it. I'm just so bad about being consistent. Yeah. It's like getting a little routine going because I do the same thing. I would much rather earth on the ground a hundredfold. That's why I go to the ocean and I'll go to the beach multiple times during the day, like in between clients, I was earthing because I'm regulating myself essentially in my nervous system so that I'm staying at that level all day long. Um, so yeah, but these are, as I said, these are just little hacks. These are, in my opinion, an extra two going outside like we need the uva and gamma rays we have to we have to set off certain hormones that are affected by light and so every morning if i'm not going to the beach i will roll out of bed before i look at any light any artificial stimulus at all and i go and stand outside and stare at the sky for at least a minute to five minutes and then i'll come in and start my day or i'll go to the beach just depending on what um but yeah, it's like getting in the habit. So I have these habits. So I do that in the morning. I always spend a good few hours in the middle of the day out. And then as that light changes, um, I'll watch the sun change light come down. And then if I can, I'll put my um, blue blockers on. So I've gotten in the habit. And then before bed, I've got one of those, um, I've got a blue blocker red light in the lamp next to my bed. So that goes on. And it just, it's what it's doing is essentially, it's like sleep tra training a child, right? <laughs> Telling your body, okay, Jessica, it's time for bed. Like, so that your hormones and your nervous system can do all the things that it needs to do to calm and settle to go into those states. So I've gotten good at like, okay, the light goes on, triggers to the brain. Okay, no more being on your phone or on any devices. Um, so yeah, so that's really good. And then I do my NRT resets before I go to sleep. And again, I regulate myself into that parasympathetic state. So I've kind of now made it a bit more like, because otherwise, like you said, it's like, oh, I forget to do that and I forget to do this. And if anything, this is, so you can see, I've just turned it on the little mm. lasers and you've got multiple different lasers doing different things. But this is the one I forget the most. So often if I'm online doing something, I'm like, oh, this is a good time to sit and have it on my wrist for half an hour. 
because you can't get it wet either. So like me being, you know, in the kitchen or modeling around with water is not a good idea with a couple of thousand dollar bloody oh, gosh. laser watch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you have a good routine. I feel like here's another thing. Gosh, I just, I'm not good about anything, but the book At- Atomic Habits didn't finish it, but, uh, or maybe I did. And it was just so long ago. I don't remember. But anyways, I just know that they talked about like habit stacking and mm. I really should read it again. Yeah. Yeah. The basic rule of thumb of habits is you want to do something with consistency for a minimum of three weeks, ideally a month. Right. So if it was, OK, I'm going to have no screens and red lights from this time, at nine o'clock or whatever time of night it is every day. And you set an alarm on your phone and that just becomes the norm. Once you do that succinctly every day for around about a month, that will convert likely into something that you just do rather than something you have to think about doing and then you add the next one I'm sure the book's saying something along the lines and you you essentially build out your habits rather than just doing one thing or doing the other the stats on that as well is like if you do one thing focus on one thing for three weeks or a month you've got an 86 percent chance of converting that thing into something that you then do Add a second thing to that at the same time, that drops to 33%. Add a third thing, and it's less than one. We can't do too much at the same time. We have to build on these things, because otherwise, like you said, it's just like it doesn't become ingrained, and it's something that you're always trying to make yourself do rather than just something that becomes a part of your day. Yeah, no, that's so true. It's such a good point. And it's also like kind of what I say to some people that, you know, maybe aren't ready to like go jump in straight to carnivore. It's like, we well, don't do everything at once if you don't want to. Like start mm-hmm. with giving this up or that, like don't need to take everything on at once. So yeah, why would habits be any different than that? Yeah, yeah totally. <laughs> um, okay, so we got a few questions from people and let's just, let's see, we have a little bit of time. So let's do a couple of them. Um, How do you handle... I guess this is for like both of us too. How do you handle your kids when you're eating out and they want to eat a standard American diet, even though you're not American, but you know, whatever. <laughs> How do you, if they want to eat all the things, I think we're a little different on this. What's we your so approach? <laughs> oh my gosh. We're, we're, I mean, I'm actually now trying to just slightly change my approach because I got quite militant and, and we talked about this last time you're on my podcast you were just now like thinking oh and I haven't asked you since if you've made any changes so a couple um it's so hard because especially with India my middle daughter I've got three girls my middle daughter um had a literally an autoimmune condition and her gut was a state like it was really, really bad. And so we were healing her. And I think because we were coming from a different approach from most people, we were incredibly strict. Like you can't have these things. These things are making you sick. Like it's just a hard no. And so softening around that a little bit is like, I guess we now give them a little bit of opportunity to eat if they choose to some low oxalate plants. So that would be like pickles, olives and iceberg lettuce that is pretty much it and then we if we have I'm all about experience right so like in New Zealand you can go berry picking you can go strawberry picking or blueberry picking and afterwards they literally pour them in with a fresh cream and stuff and they'll make fruit fresh ice cream like once a year they'll have that and we'll do the experience of going picking together and then at the end they'll have that but that's it for the year. Like we're quite like, they don't have fruit in their world. They have very, very limited veg. And most of the time they don't really choose to have it anyway. They love pickles, um, but like iceberg lettuce and it's $8 for a bloody iceberg lettuce with zero nutritional capacity. But, you know, um, we offer it to them and sometimes they'll have it and sometimes they won't. But I am trying to move to a state of being like allowing them to gain wisdom now what my my um teacher said to me the other day knowledge and intellect is one thing 
all right? And someone can be really knowledgeable and have tons of intellect and da da da. But wisdom is another because wisdom comes from experience. And so you can have all the knowledge in the world and have zero wisdom. And I, that's what I've done to my kids. I have given them all the knowledge. This is why, la, 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 but they've had no experience of that. So essentially they are, they don't have a choice, which means that they haven't experienced feeling crappy and going, oh no, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to do this instead. So they don't have wisdom. They just have knowledge. And I haven't allowed them to gain that. And that's my fault as a parent. Um, because as I said, I was just trying to heal Indy. So now I'm like, okay, if we go to something and you want to have something let's let's see but I'm still not there like we went to we went to a friend's for dinner yesterday and she did a beautiful roast lamb and she'd done pumpkin and potato and something on the side and you know my kids are like looking at me with these big eyes and I feel so bad because I'm like oh I'm such a monster they're like can we have a potato bomb and I'm like yeah, you can have one potato. Like, I'm like, and I don't want to be like this. I think it's just because I grew up sick, as I said, and I don't want my kids to be ill. And because I know the impact of those foods on their bodies, it's so hard for me to take that hat off and be the mum and not, and you know, because this is someone's childhood. I'm the mother, but this is their childhood that I'm affecting. And I don't want to be like about food. And I need them to be able to have the experience, learn for themselves, and then gain that wisdom so that they make the right choices. Because at the moment, I fear them leaving home and then just going, rah. <laughs> so, and Indiana being the size of a bloody bus. <laughs> and, so, and that's probably what will happen if I don't allow them to have an experience for themselves. But I'm still finding my way with that because knowing how addictive foods are and knowing how damaging carbohydrates are I'm I'm really just trying to find my way with that but yeah. yeah you and I are very different so me I would be like no you can't have it or you can have limited this that and the other or like what I did on Saturday was I went to a birthday party and um, we'd made some carnival pizza the night before and so I just put the pizza in a ziploc bag I made some um, like beef protein cookies um, just with the equip powder and so she had a cookie and a bit of pizza. And so it doesn't look like to her little buddies around her that she's eating much different from the other kids, not knowing that all of that is carnivore. And um, so, yeah, so we'll do little things like that as well, just so they don't feel so isolated from their peers because I don't want to affect that either. Yeah, I know the kids thing. It's so hard. The kids thing is so tough. I mean, so we do a little bit of a freedom for them to choose when we're out. Like everything I have at the house, I want to be able to say yes to. Um, even popsicles, if they're all fruit, they're like, give me more, give me more. So even that's annoying to have at the house. So like I try to do like any random treats they're going to have outside of the house. So I don't have to try and moderate for them. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, I mean, if we're going out to eat, I would say like 98% of the time, like we're still ordering carnivore stuff for them. Once in a while, maybe they'll get something at a restaurant that's not carnivore, whatever, but where they do have their freedom a little bit is like at a kid's birthday party. So we were at one yesterday and I still have like some you know, like nose, like there was bag of bags, little bags of chips all over like the tables. And I'm like, oh, great. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, and they, of course, immediately, I mean, we just get there and that's what they want. I'm like, okay. So they grab, like, you're not having the Cheetos. Like, sorry, we're not going to have red dye 40 chips. Like you can have the potato chips in seed oils. Wonderful. Great. But like, we're not going to have <laughs> the red dye 40. So they each had a bag of chips and, and then we had them like the cake came out and it's like, you're not having this big ass slice. Like we split one for both of them. So we try and just like teach them proper nutrition and be aware. Like, so they know like what we eat at home and why we're eating it. And they know like if they're going to have some fruit to pair it with the protein. So we talk a lot about macros and I just, I'm, 
I'm aware, like, I don't want to give them an eating disorder. I don't want them to go to a friend's house and binge on all the things. So that's why I do allow them to have some control, but just try and like talk to them like, okay, like you don't need to eat all this cake, like listen to your body. And later if they're running around like a maniac, it's like, okay, you see how you feel right now? This is because of that. So we do give them some control and freedom, but try and like explain it to them and just teach them more about nutrition than just saying, oh, this food is bad. Like I'll tell them why it's not the best for their bodies. So, but it's mm-hmm. tough, you know? It and- is. It's so hard because I would love to throw caution to the wind and be like, right guys, you can make all your own decisions, but I know that'd be all bad. And I just, I don't know how to navigate that from where I'm at to where I want to be. And so it's just going to take some time and some play, but it is tricky being a parent because I want them to be the healthiest, happiest versions of themselves. But I also know by being so militant, I'm actually making them in defensive states if we're all talking, because ultimately it all comes back down to your nervous system. And then if I'm stressing them out by being like, yeah, you can't do this or you can't, you know, then that's having an impact and negative effect on their nervous system anyway. So am I helping their health by being like this? Like I've had to really start looking at how, how I'm affecting them. And yeah, so it's, oh my God, it's such a mission, isn't it? Like it's good with winter. My daughter, my youngest is being carnivore since birth. So she, luckily she hasn't had any, pretty much anything we've given her you know, the odd bit of fruit. Um, I think she had some watermelon for the first time in her life the other day. She did not know what it was. <laughs> like, you know, she's just like looking at it, poking at it. Um, but yeah, it's, it. she will just say no. Like she'll look, she doesn't think of those things as food. She just looks around and then she just wants the meat. Um, and so that's, it's easier with her because it's just natural what she wants. But the other two, you know, they're older and all their kids, all the kids around them are just eating absolute shit. Like it's so hard as well to watch other people's children filling themselves up of seed oils. And the thing is, is people don't realize that seed oils don't just go away. It's not like, oh, we just metabolize that and that's gone. Like eight years, 10 years, like they store in our cell membrane, like that they affect our body on such a like toxic level and it's not just then it's not like oh I can eat this and I'll you know my body will heal it's like how long is that going to take to actually get out of your system like people don't even think of these things and it's like oh yeah it's just a little bag of crisps and it's hard to see because I think if everybody had the knowledge that we did it just this wouldn't be happening because I know people don't want to harm their kids like I know in my heart that people have good intention I you know what I I think some people it's um, because I have a lot of friends that, that know what I'm saying. They listen to what, I mean, they know what we're doing and Mm -hmm. I I don't want to say it's that they don't care. I think it's more of a, oh, they'll be fine. Like, it's not that big of a deal. They'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm appalled at the things some kids eat. And it's just, it makes me frustrated that this food even exists because Mm -hmm. now we have to handle it and we have to deal with it and we have to be the bad guy or why like every event has to like revolve around food that I don't want my kids to be having. And now I have to, it just, I mean, people can eat however they want, but it's just annoying that it just makes my job harder. Because now I have to be like, no, you're not going to have this bag of red dye 40 candy. Like, why do we have to give each other candy for like different events and like Valentine's Day at our little co-op? I'm like, oh my gosh, like, sorry, everything went right in the trash. If you go to my co-op and you're listening, it went right in the trash. (laughs) Well, see, I just, I won't even take it now. I'll just say, thank you so much. But you know, we won't have that. So we'll just leave this here because I also hate wasting food. Mm -hmm. Although that's not food, I still, it's ingrained in me not to, not to waste anything. And but you're right. Like it is this cultural thing. And because it's so, you know, it's so widely done that everybody does that, that we do get a bit complacent. We're like, oh, it can't be that bad. Cause look, everybody else's kids are doing it and they're okay. But what we have missed is the fact that we didn't grow up with this. Like it wasn't even available to us. It didn't exist before. And so now that it, now that it's rampant everywhere, like before Nobody would have given your child a candy. Like, no way. When I was growing up, 
no way in hell. Like McDonald's, we probably had once a year when I was younger and it was for a birthday party. Like you go to a birthday party at McDonald's and that was it. Like it wasn't this regular thing. It wasn't normalized. It wasn't socially acceptable to be feeding your kids shit. And everybody knew that, right? It was pretty much meat and three veg, you know, my, my growing up and same with my grandparents. And we don't even know the impacts on our children that have grown up with this completely different way of eating processed shit garbage and what it's going to do to them. And it's scary. That part's frightening because like you said, we, we don't actually, we don't have a choice. It's everywhere. We're the bad guys now because we want our kids to just eat real food and we're apparently the weird ones. <laughs> and, you know, I go up against a lot of, you know, a lot of people going, oh, just, you know, can she just, oh, this, oh, just what about just, you know, or, oh, can she have a substitute? Can you give her something slightly less poisonous? And I'm, it's hard. It sucks. I wish, I wish, I almost wish either I didn't know what I know and then I could just like blissfully give my kids whatever. But this is, it is powerful and helpful to have this because I see why other people's children are dysregulated, mm -hmm. why their hormones are imbalanced, why they've got skin conditions, why they're malnourished and they've got these big, deep, bloody rings around their eyes and they're eight. Like they go to sleep at 10 o'clock or they have no bedtime. Like I'm a bed at line like my kids are all asleep by 7 p.m like I you know and I just so it's it's challenging because we're the ones that are the anomalies like to the rest of the world and you get judged by that quite harshly and it's just like I'm fine with it because I'm okay with people not liking me or liking what I do but it is hard especially for the girls more than me because they're the ones as well having to say to their peers oh, no, we don't eat that, or no, I'm not allowed that, or no, whatever it is. Nobody should um, eat it. Nobody should be allowed it. That's why it's just so frustrating that it's just all this crap is just so normalized. And it's not just like a once in a while thing. Like you can tell the people that eat this way all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just like, oh, you're randomly having this candy. No, the majority of the people are eating garbage all the time. And it's, mm -hmm. it's sad because it's – it's just like, okay, well, you know, all these kids that are going on medication for ADHD, it's like, what if you oh. gave them bacon and eggs for breakfast instead of a bowl of tricks? Maybe they wouldn't need to be medicated, you know? I don't know. I know the future is quite scary like that, but I'm still having so much hope because carnival is becoming so much more widely known about and normalized. Um, I was out for dinner the other night and, you know, someone asked me about that, like, do you, are you finding you're getting as much? And it's not, it is becoming, oh yeah, my brother's doing that. Oh, my husband's did that. Oh, yeah. this like, yes, like, let's make this, let's like this normal and make that really abnormal again, because it used to be, and we used to look at people and be like, oh, why are you feeding your kid a massive ice cream? Oh God, it's so hard. It's so hard. We was at something the other day and this woman's got this baby. She's not even one years old. She's got this massive ice cream, bigger than her face. And then, you know, her mum gives her a, a little, like, bottle, as in, like, a baby bottle filled with juice. And I'm going, that kid has got zero chance in life. Like, that's not <laughs> okay. It is child abuse. And it's and you have to sit there and, and say nothing. And that's, the you know, and they're all sitting there with their cakes and their whatever and the baby's drinking a juice bottle and eating a massive ice cream at like nine in the morning. And I'm like, what has happened? And these people are sick. Like everyone at that table is sick, right? They're all um, systemically inflamed. They're all obese. They're all, you know, and you're just sitting there going, if you just look in the mirror and see that you're not healthy and this is the way that you live, do you not think that that's not going to happen to your child? Exactly. It's like this dissociation. It's so hard to be awake in a crazy lunatic world. It really is. And it's just so frustrating. I just want to like shake people. But it's like, even if they know about it and they're still not making changes, I always wonder like, why? Is it just you just don't think anything bad will happen? You don't think it's that big of a, I, or big of a deal? Or you just lazy? Like, is it? I think it's a lot of it is lazy parenting. Like, you are looking for convenience. But I mean, there's, I, I don't think it's that hard to be carnivore. If you're going through 
McDonald's, just get the burger patties. Like you don't need the Coke and the fries and the bun. So I feel like that's, you know, the, the convenience is like an excuse. I think it's so easy to be carnivore anywhere you want. You just oh need God, to it do is. it. It is. <laughs> eat anywhere so easily and I think it's too because people are so far from here that they're like how do I go from here to here like it's just too big a leap and that's why what you're saying is really helpful like we just want to go okay let's just have an awareness let's go okay let's get back to real food that is a big step first step let's get rid of all the processed garbage if it, if it has ingredients it's the wrong thing like if it's had a life and it's either meat or plant great go there first yeah and then go okay right now which are the most toxic plants okay next i'm going to take out the most toxic plants and you just slowly incrementally change the ways and you don't need to tell your kids this is the other thing too we're all talking to our children like they're equals now, I'm not saying we should be above or below our children, but what I mean is they're kids. They don't develop their brain at all the different pieces until they're 25. And that's why that parents exist. Because if they wouldn't, you'd have a baby eating candy, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, and ending up, you know, malnourished and dead at this point. So, and sick and whatever. So, like, it's our job. It is still our job. It isn't your job to be your your friend to your child, you've got to give them boundaries to keep them safe and healthy and well. And I think it's like people just don't know how to get from that point to that point. And then they try and like negotiate with their children. It's the same with like screens. My kids have no screens Monday to Friday at all. And then people that have a lot of screen time, they're like, how did you do it? It's like, well, I didn't really do it because it's always been that way. So it's kind of easier for me and it's easy for me to say, I'll just say no. But like, I know parents have you know, the kids having full-blown massive tantrums and running away and throwing things and going crazy when we take away these toxic processed addictive foods and screens, they can't handle it. And so parents, you're like, you have to go through a rough time with your children to, to get them to a place that's actually right for them. But most people don't want to do it. It's too hard. They don't have the yes. time. They don't have energy I just want to make the my kid battles. happy mm -hmm. is it really that bad like is it you know like do you think about screens as well they, these didn't exist I didn't have a phone till I was 17 years old yeah like, yeah people we don't, don't they don't want to deal with battling their kids and I will say the screen time that is another gnarly thing um we've always been super mindful Archer didn't even watch a peep until like I, like all my friends when they, the kids were babies were like, oh, I put my baby in front of the TV so I could cook dinner. Like we were adamant like up until age two is like what like the AAP says or whatever, like do not let your kid have any screen time. So we did not And it's not like he turned two and we plopped him in front of the screen time. But we've always been like really aware and really tried to minimize it um, mm -hmm. a handful of months back, probably like six months ago or so. It kind of crept away from us. Like it's like, OK, go on for a few minutes, do this because it's like the only time I can get something done or the only time there's silence is if they were on it and it got carried away. And then, so then we did like a three month re reset where they didn't have any screen time for three months. And wow. oh my gosh, what a difference. Mm. They get more creative and they stop asking after yeah. like a week or two, they stop asking for it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I mean, we were watching these TikToks on like what happens when you do stop and, you know, what your kid does and like the tantrums lessen and their feelings are better and this, that, and the other. And I a hundred percent recommend, sorry, I had to swallow everyone doing, you know, <laughs> give it up for a good chunk and see like how your child is different. So we also pretty much don't do it during the week unless it's like I have a call and no one's here to watch them, but we do like yeah. family movie night on the weekends. We'll like split up one movie over a couple of nights. And then once in a while, Archer on the weekend, will get um, some of his video games. He just recently got video games, um, Nintendo for Christmas, but we were just talking about the other night. I'd almost like rather him play video games than just sit and watch something because at least oh. you're doing something and some hand-eye yeah. coordination. But yeah, yes. the screen time is a whole other monster for sure. Yeah, it, it, it is a monster. But we just got to realize that these things didn't exist. They didn't exist for us. We've grown up and, and we think, oh, we're fine. But we didn't grow up with this stuff. Like, if I think about the baby as well, she's three and a half now. She's not a baby. But, you know, all oh, you're up all night, you're breastfeeding. I've got my phone in my hand. That's also in her face. Like, from birth, 
And it's really hard because we're super addicted. I don't realize sometimes with my phone's in my hand and I'm like, shit, mm-hmm. like, why am I picking that up? Like, it's so, they're so addictive. So even for us, I have to put limitations on mine because I'm super addicted to it. And like that little thing of getting up and not looking at your phone and getting straight out and looking at the light, it literally affects our hormonal response so much because having that artificial light in your face first thing in the morning is telling your brain that it's one o'clock in the afternoon. So you're messing with your hormonal release massively and therefore the way that your body like works. And by just looking at the light, I, I did this experiment where I did not, I changed nothing else and I just stuck my head out the bedroom window. And at first it was, it wasn't even walking outside. I just took my head out the window and opened my eyes. And I did that religiously and my body fat came down like significantly. And I was like, I've done nothing. Yeah. And so I was like, because of the way that our hormones react to light, you it will tell your body how much fat you have on it. And that, gets recalibrated whereas if you're telling your if your brain's telling you your body's telling your brain that you have x amount of body fat and you need to hold on to it then it will so it affects so many things so the way i got my clients to do this was I like look i've dropped body fat i've got leaner i've done nothing but stick my head out the window you're gonna do that too and they do because they're like oh i want to lose body fat i want to be leaner just by looking at the light but yeah it's really important so there's just to put these little processes in and just realize like with our children as well, as convenient and easier to, as it is, we're robbing them. We're, we're rob- we're taking from their health for our convenience of, I need you to shut up and just be over there for a minute and just let me breathe. Mm-hmm. And like you said, when you get over that first initial hurdle, it's beautiful. They're building things and creating things and out in the garden. And then, you know, like that's how we grew up, you know, like even then they don't have the freedom we did because we were gone for five hours. We were off with all our mates climbing trees and building things and doing things. And it'd be like, be home for dinner. And you just go be home before the sun goes down. And that was literally it. Now I have an 11 year old and eight year old, and I can't even let them go two minutes down the road to the playground by themselves because I'm a bad parent like you know like it's just such a different world and I'm frightened to see what my grandchildren are you know so we're just I guess for me as well and I know this stands for you as well Courtney is that the reason that we do this and share this way of living and stuff is because we want a better world for our kids and for our grandchildren and we can see what has become normalized and what we don't want them to to end up in and so you end up you know, going against the grain with everything and being a bit of a loner, but that's okay because (laughs) you know you're doing the right thing. So you just keep on going. Yeah. And you know what? Like our age, I know you're close to my age. I don't like, I'll be 40 in June. How old are you? I'll be 41 in about three weeks. Okay. Okay. So we had like, we are like the perfect age group. Like we had the best like childhood and because technology didn't happen till we were older, you know? So it's like, we have like the best of both worlds in a way. We still got to have the childhood. I mean, I got a phone when I was 16, but that was because I was driving and the phone didn't do anything, you know? And then- It was just, and you could only fit so many words into a message. (laughs) Exactly. So it's like, yeah, now being born into- technology like it's just totally different and yeah like going and playing outside till the street lights came on like there's no way I would even well let my kids these days because there's freaking lunatics out there and I don't know like if it was just safer back when we were kids or there wasn't the internet so we didn't know how crazy that, people were but that's what I think it was I think it's just that we didn't know I don't think there's a higher prevalence of nasty, crazy people. I just think like, yeah, like you said, the spotlight's on it more. And because kids used to look after each other, right? Like there would be like a a waddle of children together of different ages. And the older ones learned to look after the younger ones. And there was this, it would just naturally beautifully evolve, right? And if something happened, one of the kids would run and get an adult or whatever, like it was, they would really look out for each other. And so it just, yeah, it felt like a much safer environment. But I think the environment's the same. It's us and our perception of of what's right. And because we haven't then allowed them to go and do those things and that's become, you know, taboo or you're a bad parent or you're neglecting, it's better to have them at home, shove a screen in their face 
than them being outside playing with their mates and learning as well how to look after older or younger children as well as learning how to be a part of society because at the moment these kids that are growing up without this interaction and this isn't just school because obviously we don't we don't we homeschool we don't send our kids to school you know they aren't learning to to like support each other as children and they're meant to we're meant to be teaching our kids to be happy healthy grown-ups and most of us aren't teaching them how to to live outside of a home with all the comforts and everything in a safe secure environment so then they have no sensory acuity they have no awareness yes or even I call it spidey sense, right? Like I knew if someone was a bit dodgy, if I was at the playground and like all the kids would, it was like a feeling. You'd be like, oh, there's someone weird over there. Let's go guys. And you yeah. just, you know, you wouldn't be like, oh my God, there's this weird man at the playground and let's tell everybody. And like, it, you know, it was just, you just navigated it and you learned to trust your gut and that's gone. Like how were they meant to have any kind of, how were they meant to learn that without the experience? They can't have it. Intellect doesn't work. They have to have experience and wisdom. So it's so hard. Like I would love to just be like, yeah, go off. But I have had, um, so my kids run. So they do athletics, but both of my big girls like to run. And to the roundabout and back on our street is exactly a mile. And so they'll often run to the roundabout and back. And, you know, I think the neighbors thought that we were abusing our children and stuff. (laughs) <laughs> Why that was their punishment <laughs> yeah it's like you know and the, we call them curtain twitches like they will never say anything to you and just ask you directly but they'll judge and they'll talk talk behind their curtains and they'll peer out at you and it's like I'm very much I'd rather you just say it to me um because there's a huge amount of judgment but then these old people that are curtain twitches looking at me judging what I'm doing with me and my children they did the same thing when they were, you know, that they, it was fine for them. Their parents wouldn't have been helicoptering around the middle every second. But now because of the current climate, they're judging me, even though, you know, it's. Oh. I like that word, though. Curtain twitchers. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Um, okay. Well, you're going to catch me outside at six in the morning tomorrow. I'm get I got to get back on this morning light thing. I did it like months and months ago. I, I would be better about it, but I mean, I'm the worst. I immediately, when I wake up, that's when I'm on my phone. So that way I can get caught up and get things done before my kids wake up. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, this might not be great for me, but at least my kids aren't going to be seeing on my, me on my phone all day. Like I can get this stuff done before, but maybe that's not the best plan of attack if that's going to be affecting me. Like, okay, great. I, I'm only fat because I'm not going outside in the morning. I hope it is as easy as that to get rid of this excess weight. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thing is, is eat like, like, like we said, right? The nervous system runs everything and all of these different systems that are run by the nervous system only can operate if our nervous system is healthy and well. So like if you can learn to regulate yourself, your body fat will come off. If you can stay in that zone where your body can do all the things it needs to do, then it will. If we set up our light and our circadian rhythm so that our our body can actually calibrate how much fat stores and how much we require and give that information to our brain, and that's about your leptin hormone, in resetting that, it's quite quick to do. And then sure enough, yeah, the body fat came off. I was really surprised because I was like, how much does light really affect da, da, da. But, you know, I'm always up for it. And I was like, wow, I'm definitely, definitely, definitely leaner. And I did nothing else. Um, so, yes, if give it a go. I'm okay. also going to teach you how to test your nervous system and do a little regulation before you go to sleep. That's going to help you with your sleep and repair stuff too. Yes, please. And- <laughs> Hey. Awesome. Okay. We went a little bit over, so we have a ton of questions we didn't even get to. Okay. I won't even say a ton. We have a handful of questions we didn't get to. We'll have <laughs> to do like a part two sometime. Um, yeah. But thank you so much for joining me. Let everyone know where they can find you and what you offer right now. Yeah. So at the moment, I'm not doing one-on-one clients for less than like three to three to six months. But I have a couple of uh, nutritional programs that are really good at transitioning over to carnivore um, and all the whys. I'm very much about like, if someone tells me to do something, I might do it for a little while. But if I know the why behind it, then I'm likely to adopt it. So it tells you about the ancestral stuff, about all the stuff, about how we got to the situation we are in with food. 
so yeah so there's two different food programs programs that I offer and um, I'm going to be running this nervous system masterclass in the next couple of weeks so watch out for that I am mainly on Instagram either the, at the carnival mummy with a mu for the Americans not M-E-M-O. <laughs> and um, at the Jessica treatment is the nervous system stuff but it kind of blends around and I'll link everything for everyone so oh. awesome yeah. thank you so much I'm excited um, for your upcoming stuff too so yay, I thought this was a good chat. I hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll catch you next time.